Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashanti Carter, and I am the program manager of the Rodham Institute. It's great to be with you today. So you know how we do it. For this installation of the Rodham Impact Speaker Series, I'm just gonna to talk to you a little bit about the Rodham Institute, and then we're gonna move on to our conversation. And I am experiencing some technical difficulties, but that's okay. So coming up, of course, November 3rd, we want everyone to get out and vote. Please, please, please look at the issues that affect you and your loved ones. Let your voice be heard. Get out and vote. Stay tuned, November 10th, we're gonna have a conversation with Dr. Lent Johnson, as well as Dr. George Kim. And this will be about advanced colorectal cancer treatment and what you should know. So join us on November 10th, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is something I'm really excited about. We're gonna wind down the rest of the year and discuss aging. So November 17th, we're gonna have a great conversation about the healthy brain, living long with balance training with Dr. Al Chalabi and my girl, Ms. Priscilla Moore. December 8th, we're gonna have changes of the aging brain with Dr. Christina Prather. And December 15th, we're gonna have a great conversation about eating healthy for blood sugar control. And you know, strong women, they stay young, forever young. So about the Rodham Institute, it's one struggle, on many, on many fronts. So in order to achieve health equity, we need the following, social justice, economic justice, and legal justice. And of course, we were founded in um, 2013 in honor of the late Dorothy Rodham by the founding director, Dr. Jahan, as we affectionately call her, Dr. Gigi Elbayumi. And the Rodham Institute, we take a holistic approach to health. And we do this through education. There are three priority areas that Rodham concentrates on. And that includes youth education programming and workforce development, training current and future health professionals in applied health equity. And of course, what we're doing here, community collaboration. Those are our three pillars. You guys, check out our website. There's so much information from our events to even updates on COVID where you can go and get tested, various resources to help you and your loved ones during this pandemic. This work of course cannot be done without the Rodham staff. We have Ms. Tracy Bass, the Director of Health and Workforce Pipeline Programs, Ms. Christina Williams, the Director of Community Engagement, and of course, I introduce myself, Ashanti Carter, Program Manager. Please, let's keep in touch. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, email us, but I have one thing to say. Did you guys know that our Facebook page is not verified? We need the blue check mark. So please go to Facebook at GW Rodham Institute and like our page. That way we can get so many more followers, we can get the blue check mark. That's what we want, that's our goal. So do that for us, 3000 followers in 30 days. Help us out with that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed moderator, Mr. Breck Fisher, who attended UCLA. And he has experience in research and social sciences Breck served as a mediator for the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office Dispute Resolution Program, and his love of law and civic engagement was actually birthed at um, the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office. And we are so, so glad and so honored to have him with us as a Rodham intern. So Breck, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Ashante, for the introduction. I would also like to thank Dr. Gigi Elbayumi and Rodham Institute for giving me this opportunity and platform to discuss voting 
and its importance. So we have esteemed panelists today, and I would like to introduce them. So we have Sofiat abdul -Zarak. She is co-founder and CEO of Good Friend. She specializes in business strategy, product management, and development, and digital transformation. Over the course of her career, she has worked for some of the world's most notable banks, companies, and nonprofits. At Goodfine, she leads the company's general direction with a specific focus on operations and strategy. Up next, we've got Clifford D. Tatum. He is the Chief Information Security Officer for the District of Columbia Board of Elections, where he supports the day-to-day -day security and risk information management activities of the agency. Tatum specializes in compliance activities, meeting the critical mandates of the Help America Vote Act and the National Voter Registration Act. And last but definitely not least, we have Ms. Anna Hing. She is a doctoral candidate in the Community Health Sciences at the Fielding School of Public Health, University of California, Los Angeles. Anna Hing's research focuses on how social inequities produce health disparities. Her dissertation research examines the relationship between voter suppression as a form of structural racism and racial health disparities in life expectancy and infant mortality. So we have a great panel here uh, covering a nice broad spectrum of topics that we will be discussing today. So this first question, anyone is more than welcome to tackle it. So let's begin. Examining the health disparities that plague communities of color, which means that African Americans live sicker and die younger compared to their white counterparts, can you describe how voter suppression impacts the health of people of color? Um, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, that's such a great question. And thank you so much for having me here. Um, there are so many ways in which voter suppression can influence health for people of color. Um, and when we think about voter suppression, we really need to think about it as a form of structural racism, meaning that it's part of the macro level systems, social forces, ideologies, institutions, and processes that create and maintain inequities based on your racial group. Um, so we know that structural racism um, is bad for your health. In a lot of ways, it makes you more vulnerable to other social risks. And so when we think about voter suppression in that way, then we can understand how that also makes you um, more vulnerable. And so um, first, we can think about how voter suppression is maybe connected to the creation of policies and laws. So that spans the local to national levels. Um, and those policies determine how resources, capital, opportunity are distributed throughout our society. And then because of that stratification, some people have more resources to use as a buffer um, and some people have fewer. And so those with fewer resources may end up living in environments filled with more exposure to risk and that risk has negative consequences for your health. Um, there's my preliminary research from my dissertation suggests that um, higher inequality in voting, which is kind of the outcome of voter suppression, is tied to higher levels of segregation and also higher levels of income inequality. We know that living in segregated neighborhoods can be bad for your health because that goes along with a lot of other environmental stressors and that um, higher income inequality means that some people have much more and some people have less and income inequality is also bad for health um, at the population level and for the individual. Um, and then you can also think about voter suppression as a form of discrimination. So if um, I'm not allowed to vote, I might feel a stigma associated with that and I might feel like a second class citizen. Um, and so all of that makes me feel disempowered. It might make me angry. It might make me anxious. Um, and those feelings and the rumination of like those experiences with discrimination operate through stress processes to cause poor health, um, both like in the short term as well as across the long term. Um, so if you keep experiencing discrimination through voter suppression and other things that actually can accumulate over your life course um, and negatively impact your health. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of ways. And then even thinking about voting today in the pandemic, and just the fact that you, um, if you go to vote on election day, you might be standing in line, you have to wait for a while. We know that um, African American voters wait twice as long to vote as white voters. Um, and so even just that experience of standing online, if they're either in like heat or cold conditions that can influence your health. And then during the pandemic, you might be exposed to the virus if precautions aren't taken. And so these are all different ways in which voter suppression and voting can be um, connected to your health. Fantastic answer. Um, does anyone else want to jump in? 
I think from an administrative perspective, we we recognize that that voters feel anxiety about uh, number one whether their ballot is going to count and 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 how do they get their ballot and once they submit their ballot, are they certain that their election administrator is going to count the ballot? So all of those anxieties, I think, do have an impact on on an individual's emotional being. Uh, the political uh, the political arguments that are taking place today lend themselves to a greater uh, belief in voter suppression, even when what what a voter or what a block of citizens may be experiencing is not necessarily an intentional or an intent to suppress the vote or an attempt to make it more difficult for, for people to vote. Um, we focus on providing as many uh, accessible avenues to, for, to allow a voter to, to, to request their ballot, to cast their ballot. And a good number of the election administrators that I know and have worked with in the past focus on uh, accessibility uh, both physically and and mentally for all voters, and and we recognize though that when things don't go the way a voter thinks they should go, people tend to to become emotional about it, and I think that has a has an impact on their emotional being. I really appreciate that you brought up accessibility issues because um, we know that those with poor health are less likely to vote in person because of the barriers that accompany that. And so by making the polls as equitable as possible um, in terms of like ability access and then like other different points as well um, is really useful because of, especially too, if we're thinking about voter suppression and health and if voter suppression is making you sick um, and being sick, you're less likely to vote, then there's kind of this like feedback loop of um, voter suppression and poor health in which you experience it and then are further more likely to not vote um, because of your health status. Okay, we've definitely looked at it from a, mic a macro level. So let's look into it um, with regards to like the family structure and political views. So do we see older voters sharing the same political views as their parents compared to when they were young adults voting for the first time? Anyone's more than welcome. Interestingly, we see from the, from the young voters who participate with their parents uh, through the process, uh, we hear the stories as, as the, the first, the, the 18 year old who votes for the first time is travel to the polling places with their mom or dad for years to, to see the process. So they've become a bit more acclimated and have some sense of what, what's supposed to take place in the process. And, and then we see also voters who for first time who've never been to a polling place, they, they've never paid attention to politics in any way, shape or form. And, and they really don't have an idea of, of how to express themselves or even how the process should work. So they're, they sort of stumble through the process and and, and, and have a difficult time uh, participating in the process. And, and I think that has a direct, that's a direct correlation to what's taking place at home. How much, how much civic engagement is taking place at home? How much civic interaction is taking place that they've been exposed to at an early age? And so, yes, I think the, the, there is an age gap. The, 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 the newer, gen, the younger generation, I think is much more active than, than the, what I would say is, I wouldn't say my generation, but but the swing, we had the very active, active, active folks who were participating during the civil rights movement. And then we kind of fell into this lull a bit. And now there's this greater activity from the younger generation paying more attention uh, to, to the process. So I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a pendulum that's, that, 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 that uh, takes place. Yeah, I would agree. I think I think it's kind of hard to quantify what it looks like for, you know, certain generations and what's happening in their household and how they tend to vote. But I do think that this is a strong time um, of both economic and racial strife. And I see a lot of people kind of grabbing, you know, their own opinions by the horns and being more active in this in this space and using voting as a way 
to you know maximize on on their own opinions and in the way they want to see policy and being civically engaged so i do agree with cliff that um the younger generation is really is taking taking civil engagement seriously um definitely more so than i did at, at you know a, a young 18 um you know my nieces and nephews they they talk about it they're there's they are very engaged they understand what's happening in the world um and they're not too happy about some of the things that they're seeing and they want their their voices to be heard in a way that um you know during my time and i'm not i'm not too, too far away <laughs> um from 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 those days but um they def those types of things definitely weren't um super prevalent then and so um seeing the younger voter and the younger voices really stepping up has been super um impactful and i do think it's different than following you know your, your what your parents are like I, my dad is a as a republican or a democrat and therefore i am right i think it really is like these are the issues that mean something to me and i'm thinking about how to be civically engaged in a way that that represents my personal um you know walk of life in my personal, um, you know, in my and in what I feel personally versus I'm just going to follow the leader, right? I think I think those times are are I wouldn't say long gone, but I think I think they're less prevalent now than they have been in the past. Excellent. Uh, earlier, we discussed roadblocks that have been placed in front of communities of color with regards to accessibility to voting, but let's take a look at policy. Are voter ID laws constitutional and what groups do they primarily affect? What do we even, or excuse me, why do we even have voter ID laws and what are the historical implications? From a, from a practical perspective, it, it, it makes perfect sense to almost anyone that you ask about photo ID because we do show a photo ID when we board an airplane when we make transactions at the bank. So you have a group of folks who say, sure, why, why wouldn't we show a photo ID to, to, to go to vote? But, but on the other end of that, that pendulum, you have folks who, who don't necessarily have access to photo ID, uh, who, who, who don't actually have to have an ID for their everyday activities in life. So the idea that they have to go out and, and acquire this identification in order to exercise their, their franchise is, 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 is difficult to explain to them when it's not part of their everyday life. In years ago, when I was in the state of Georgia, the Georgia passed the photo ID law and the parties argued on both sides of the, the aisle for and against it. And we understood the for and against. And once the law passed as an administrator, we had no choice but to implement and to carry out the law. And once we saw that the law was going to pass, then the argument became, or the position became, the resources to provide photo ID needs to be brought to bear if you're going to have those type of, of, of obstacles. So that became the argument for the Democrats in the state of Georgia. And, and through that arguing, they were able to secure resources that allowed uh, the DMV and other organizations to go out into the communities and actually help those who were less capable of getting an ID to obtain an ID in order to exercise their franchise. So it, I can see both sides of the argument as an administrator. Once what, whatever the law is, I'm, I'm obligated to, to implement and to carry it out. Yeah, I agree. Like to the direct question, is it constitutional? Yes. Is it a, can be you or can it be weaponized as a form of voter suppression? Yes. And like right in therein lies the issue in the long-term problem, because if you don't have access to a voter ID, you're in effect suppressed from your vote, right? And then it's your, you know, civil duty, so to say, to be able to exercise that right. And if you're inhibited in this way, you know, is it morally wrong, right? And so I think it becomes a, a question of like ethics and morality versus, you know, like, is it legal or not, right? Because it, it is legal, is it moral? And I think that that's more of the crux of the question. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're thinking about voter identification laws too, and like how they really started appearing, um, if 
anyone is more interested in understanding kind of like how we got to this place with voting, um, Carol Anderson is a professor at Emory and she has a book called One Person, No Vote. And she really details um, like the historical conditions that gave rise to um, like voter ID laws and um, all of the negation of a lot of people's votes. But one, um, one point with um, voter ID laws and like why, especially since 2013, we've really seen um, a push of these across the states. I think in 2013, only 17 states had them and now it's up to be much, much higher. Um, but we had this Supreme Court decision of Shelby County v. Holder. And so what this did was invalidate part of the Voting Rights Act. And so states that had a history of discrimination at the polls had to go through this thing called pre-clearance and they had to get um, different electoral policies approved. And so after the Supreme Court decision in 2013, states with a history of discrimination no longer had to do that. So they were able to push past these policies that on their face don't necessarily seem discriminatory, but certainly have a disparate impact. So when we think about voter ID laws too, they really are targeting um, communities of color. And so I think like a lot of us have talked about driver's license as probably the most common form of voter identification. But when we think about it, um, just like cost it takes to get a driver's license, to go to the DMV um, and to go through that whole process, like there, there's a significant economic and time burden that is, is associated with that. And then um, also like we just look at statistics like African-Americans across the United States have um, driver's licenses at half the rates of whites. And so you can see very clearly how like even even if we say like, oh, it makes complete sense that, you know, to address voter fraud, we need to verify people's identities. There's many ways in which we can do that. And so we could also move to to include like many more forms of identification. So we could include utility bills, bank statements, um, private employer IDs, university IDs, like a lot of these are rejected at the polls, whereas um, IDs that primarily are held by white individuals can be accepted. And so um, like sometimes gun licenses are accepted, but university IDs are not. And so it's thinking about where we can build equity into the system um, if we do decide that we need to verify people's identity before they can vote. Okay, another uh, demographic that I want to look at would be immigrants coming into the United States. Um, what voting patterns are we seeing with immigrants who become citizens and earn their right to vote and why? As, as part of our uh, government function, we will uh, attend uh, immigration ceremonies to where folks are being sworn in to be citizens to register them to vote. And as they uh, settle into their communities, we see uh, their voting block, their voting activities and registration and establishing polling places and, and uh, working, manning the polling places. And then we see a, a rise in the request for information in alternative languages. So. I think immigration is is becoming a bigger part of the of the electoral process in that uh, jurisdictions are required once once their nationalities reach a certain level. I think in Section 205, where the jurisdiction is obligated to uh, provide uh, instructions in alternative languages. So. There's a there's a great impact on the on the electoral process from from the immigrant population as those as those populations grow we'll see more and more uh, alternative languages being provided to to voters around the nation. Okay, um, as we know, today's current times in the United States are very tumultuous, a lot of conflicts, especially with regards to uh, demographics, but um. Has there been an underlying aspect of racial conflict as a determinant when one decides who they should vote for? Anyone is more than welcome to tackle it if you're up to it. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but what we see from, from again, from the administrative standpoint is we, we see the the different energy levels that are expended at different polling places for different candidates for any particular contest. And so for a, a local contest like a, what we have advisory neighborhood commission commissioners or city council here in the district, we see 
uh, the, the different wards will exercise different types of political activities to support their candidate. And they'll, they'll conduct different types of, of social activities to support their candidates. Uh, and, and so, yes, I think there are racial components to politicking uh, that has an impact on the administration of elections, certainly as it, it has an impact on the, on the politics of government. And, 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 and if we talked about the politics of, of race, then that'd be, there'd be, we could, we could talk for hours about that, I suppose, but that, I'll start us off with that. Okay. So this next question is pretty dense, um, but anyone is more than welcome to address it. <clears throat> The Trump administration has put up roadblocks to deter people from voting. It was even reported in California that unauthorized ballot boxes were placed in three counties, Los Angeles, Fresno, and Orange County. And the GOP office defended these practices. Not only that, but the Trump administration is trying to delegitimize this 2020 election, claiming that it's rigged. How secure are our ballots? And how secure is the election going to be? Well, I mean, I, while I won't speak on how the Trump administration perceives anything, I do know that there is no tangible like evidence to say that if you vote via mail, especially during this pandemic where you may feel fearful of going out, that your vote will not count, that it'll be triple counted, double counted. There's just no evidence to support that. And so I would say your vote is quite secure, um, you know, via mail. So anybody else can kind of speak up to this one, but there is just no evidence to support the contrary. Um, so there's a, there's a there's a lot of energy being spent by the state election directors. There's an association known as the National Association of State Election Directors, and as well as the National Association of Secretaries of State, who are taking concerted efforts to uh, allay the concerns of their constituents about the voting process. Because part of we talked about voter suppression before, misinformation and disinformation is a great form of voter suppression. And it's being, uh, uh, to borrow Anna's term, weaponized in, a, in, a, in manners in which we've never seen in the past. And, and so we as election administrators are spending a great deal of time and energy in, in trying to convince our voters, our residents, that their vote is safe, that they can return their vote by mail, they can return their vote in a drop box, uh, and that the election administrators are doing all that they can to um, protect, to collect those votes and to count those votes in a timely manner. There are mistakes that take place in certain jurisdictions and in every, in every jurisdiction. We hire a lot of temporary workers uh, who may be involved in the process for, for the very first time, who sometimes may not follow the instructions that we give them. And, and that may lead to the mishandling of ballots as we've seen in the news. And, and then we have some folks who are just for whatever reason have a lack of personal accountability and they want to somehow interfere with the process. And that's hard to defend because if someone really wants to do something, it's, it's difficult to, to prevent someone from doing it without over-policing, over-managing the, the entire process from, a, from an administrative as well as from a social aspect. So, so we encourage and, and the elections are as safe as they've ever been. Uh, in, in many ways, they're safer than they've ever been from a cyber perspective. We're spending a lot more time, a lot more resources on protecting our infrastructure. Uh, as you know, the, you all may know the election industry was, 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 uh, was designated as a critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security. And that brought a plethora of resources to state and local governments to spend on protecting our systems, our election, electronic systems, as well as our, our technical systems, as well as our election voting system. So 
elections are safe. Uh, we need our citizens to be accountable, to, to take responsibility, to, to seek out good information, to understand when they're receiving disinformation, misinformation, ask questions. Ask questions of, of, their, of their candidates, of their politicians, of their government officials, non-elected, elected, to, to get the information that they need. More accountability. We need more accountability from our voters. Um, also, because the question of mail-in ballots was brought up and just how to go about that safely, um, I think like your ballot should get counted. Um, if you can drop it off at a ballot box, that's great. But I think the number one reason that your ballot might not get counted for a mail-in ballot is because your signature on your ballot does not match your signature that's stored in that DMV. Um, so if you have a driver's license or whatever identification is used for your, um, for your ballot, make sure that those signatures match because especially for voters of color, um, African-American voters are twice as likely to have their ballot thrown out and the number goes up even more for Hispanic and Asian voters. So that's something to really be concerned about. And I'm glad you raised that. that so we are now in the process of, of verifying signatures on absentee ballots. And it's amazing when you compare the signature on the voter registration card on the absentee ballot application to the signature on the back of the envelope. And if you think about when you first registered to vote and you think about the way you sign your signature on any particular document now, we, we for the most part, are we, we're becoming more and more minimalist about signing our signature. Mm -hmm. So we make, we're making these scribble, scribbly, sly little marks that are cute and quaint. And then when I send you your absentee ballot, you take your time and you write your name out fully guess what? It doesn't match your squiggly little circle X crisscross, but you've spelled your name correctly as, as, as you were taught to do it. But you've caused us problems now because we have to look at that squiggly mark that's on your registration card and compare it to your full, fully handwritten signature and make a decision about whether they, whether they match. And we, we here in the district, we go through three levels of signature comparison. So we're going as far as we can go to make sure that every ballot counts. I'm glad to say that we haven't rejected any ballots. Uh, we do see that uh, somehow uh, spouses sign each other's envelopes instead, <laughs> instead of their own, uh, sons and daughters. So, so that's a problem. We send letters out to those folks to ask them to, to make a correction. We, send, we will send letters out to people that forget to sign their ballot. That's a kind of a interesting phenomena as well. They'll, they'll date the thing, but they won't sign it on the back. Uh, they'll write us messages on the back of the envelope, but they won't sign it. And so that makes it difficult for us to administer, but, uh, but, but we're, we're working at it. Yeah. And I just, I do want just to reiterate that like the top level here is that voting is safe and that you can do it via the mail, but you need to do it in a knowledgeable way. The signature, like the matching signature, that's not a, a new thing since 2020. It's It's been in place for quite a while, right? And so that's a, a knowledge base perspective and, and the fact that like when you choose to vote, however you choose to vote, you need to be knowledgeable of your polling locations, just like you need to be knowledgeable of where you would drop off the mail. You need to think about your signatures. It's like you would need to have some type form of identification at the polls. Like it's, this is not like, this is not a new way to vote. And so the security being the primary part of the question, I just think that it's really important that there is like no factual evidence to invalidate the use of mail-in voting that is extreme misinformation and really detrimental, especially to older populations, populations that don't have necessarily the type of accessibility that's necessary. And I honestly feel like it's another form of voter suppression, especially within the you know minority communities. And so just want to bring it all back to it's as safe as it's ever been, if not safer, as, as Cliff pointed out. Okay, well, it's good to know that our ballots and our voting is safe, but um, should our election day be a national holiday? Yeah, it should be, full stop. If it's, if it's a duty, right, if it's, if it's our civic responsibility, if it's, if it's a constitutional right, and we are blocked by the fact that we have to go to work 
and aren't able to stand in line for two hours, three hours or whatever. And like Anna was expressing, minorities have a longer time to stand in line. So if I drive, if I, if I show up at the polls at 7 a.m. and I see a line that's gonna take me more than two hours and I need to be at work at 9 a.m. so that I can feed my family, I'm I, that you know I'm missing out on that boat, and so I do believe that the nation should make it easier for for our population to to vote and to allow us to be more civically engaged. Now there is obviously issues on either side when you think about um, you know the world being quote unquote more liberal or more X or more Y that makes one or another side feel you know, maybe uncomfortable politically to allow all citizens to vote that are eligible to vote. But I absolutely believe that it should be, you know, a national holiday. And in the event that it's not a national holiday as it is not currently, <laughs> then I do believe that there is something that business owners can do and should do to allow their employees to be able to engage in their civic duties, such as have half a days off or full days off. I think about that all the time as a young entrepreneur with four people on my team, um, as well as, you know, companies like large banks and big tech that have hundreds of thousands of employees that having a day off really could be you know get a lot more people to the polls and so where the where the system fails i really do believe private companies can step up and and help us to be able to you know let our voices be heard okay thank you excellent 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 uh this question is a little bit more technical and a bit of a shift from voting there's a lot of talk regarding packing the courts with these Supreme Court leaders, it's a lifelong position. What health policies or laws are at stake if the court is packed with conservative judges? Anna, what do you think about that? So I do need to preface that this is not necessarily my area of expertise, um, but I think that the two main areas where we should be concerned for um, the packing of the Supreme Court is in regards to reproductive health access, because we know that Roe versus Wade is often a topic of conversation um, and that that is certainly a concern, but then also um, even more encompassing than just reproductive health care is that the Affordable Care Act is probably going to be heard for a decision um, set in November, and that would investigate the constitutionality of the individual mandate to purchase health insurance. Um, and that could potentially strike down the whole act, but it might just have a portion removed. And so there's there's a lot going on there that like I can't totally speak to, um, but I think the, the worst case scenario is that if the Affordable Care Act were to be struck down, it would leave about 20 million Americans um, without health insurance. And um, even if it were partially struck down, 129 million Americans might lose their partial coverage for pre-existing conditions. And so when we're living in a pandemic and um, we are already dealing with all of these health disparities, like the fact that people could lose that much health insurance is just horrifying. Um, so it really, it's not something to be taken lightly and we should be concerned. Um, I'm sure all of us have family members or friends or know people that kind of maybe discourage voting, saying that they're not going to do it for personal reason or saying that either party doesn't really, isn't really going to benefit them. But um, in the African-American community, there are some that mean well, but would argue that due to the history of racism within the United States, neither the Republican Party nor the Democratic Party has anything tangible to offer them. As a result, some in the African-American community have stated they will not vote as part of a protest. How do you convince someone that has heard this rhetoric that voting is important and why? I mean, I have very strong opinions on this, so I, I will try to not say uh, too much, but I do believe that there is a lot of danger in you know, vote not voting in protest, right? Because there's a lot more on the ballot than the person who is or is not elected, right? Um, I, I definitely think that there are issues that are fundamentally important, whether, you know, Roe v. Wade is, is something that you are, are strong, you know, feel strongly about, or, you know, healthcare, all these, all these bigger, larger social issues are on the ballot as well. So 
you know, it's not, it's less about the person and more about what you need as a citizen and who best aligns with helping you to get those needs. Because at the end of the day, the people that are in office have a lot of power over policies and laws and they directly affect your life. And something that my father always said to me, and he is an immigrant, is that if you don't vote, you don't have a voice, right? Like you can't complain that, that you no longer, that the healthcare of 20 million people no longer exists and you're included in that pool because you decided not to vote right like there are just I, ju I just think that is highly dangerous rhetoric I'm not saying that you need to vote for one side or the other but I am saying that what you need to understand is where you fall on certain issues and to vote for the person that aligns with those issues and at the same time there are ways to think about having additional part you know multi-party systems and all of those types of things i just don't think that that's the appropriate conversation to have during an election time versus what am i doing 365 days out of the year to think about or to to organize and to effectuate change in a political system because we don't have to be a two-party system that that is no political mandate i haven't seen anywhere in the constitution where it said you know you must have democrats and republicans only like that's just not a thing um so that would be my and i think too like your vote it absolutely matters because there's so many efforts being put into place to take away your vote and stop you from voting and if your vote didn't matter then we wouldn't need to do that um, and especially to thinking um, about like, it's not it's not just your vote, but it's one less vote for like your collective group. And so um, if you think about it from that perspective, it's like disempowering all of the people who are going through the same things as you and who are voting with your voting block. And so, right, as one vote, it may not be that consequential, but as a collective group, you actually hold power. And when we look at the numbers and you see that like X percent of African-Americans or Latino voters turned out, the more voters that turn out means that the representatives who are being elected cannot ignore your group and they have to listen to you because you are making the decision. And so there is power in that. Um, and I think too, especially with the presidential election, we often get caught up in just who is the one person that you're voting for. But I think um, as Sophia was saying, there are so many things down the ballot that you can be concerned about. And especially when we're thinking about the local level, um, those measures really do influence your day-to-day -day life um, and are incredibly significant. So like in California right now, we have measures on the ballot that look at bail policies, felon disenfranchisement, affirmative action, um, taxing large-scale companies to fund under, um, or to, yeah, fund underprivileged schools. And so all of these things are trying to shift the balance um, in terms of equity. And it's incredibly important that your voice is heard across the board and not just in who is running for president. And I'm really happy that you brought up local elections because that does segue us into our next question. But um, it does also seem that, I guess, media really emphasizes a sporting event-based political system that we do have here with two sides being the primary focus of what's covered. And local elections are very, very important. Um, so say I'm a first-time voter. Where should I go to find information on candidates, especially in local elections? And the thing about these candidates is they might be teachers, nurses, law enforcement, and non-political figures with a marketing team, or they may not have an easily accessible presence online. So how am I going to find out about a nurse or say a police officer who's running in my local election, but obviously doesn't have the same coverage as Donald Trump? I mean, I still believe so. Go ahead, Sophia. That's a that's a very good question, and, and it it comes back to civic engagement from our families and from our friends. Uh, there's very little effort now at the local level in 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 providing civics education to our to our younger citizens, so they don't pay attention to government to local government, and and in fact that is actually all politics are local. That that is where the rubber meets the road on your everyday life, as, as Anna said. If you, if you don't like the way your community is policed and you didn't vote for the police chief, 
then you, you didn't raise your voice. You didn't use your vote to decide how your community is going to be policed. If you don't like the way your roads are being paved by your city council and you didn't vote, you, 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 didn't, you, you didn't make a, a decision, you didn't help make a decision on who's going to lead your county or your city on helping build your community. And I think our young folks misunderstand that. So, but for resources for finding that information, who, who are our mentors in the community that are plugged into the political process? That's what, that's what a young person should look for. Listening to the campaign ads is not going to really give them the information that they're seeking. So mentors, role models, teachers, administrators, the, the, the minister, the, the barbershop, uh, barbers at the barbershop, there's, there's a number of folks who are actively engaged in, in, their, in their cities that, that can share the information. And it may be biased or, or partisan to their particular candidate, but at least you're gonna get an honest argument from them about what they believe about their candidate. And, and, and I think that's where, the, where you should start, a mentor and a, and, a, and, a, and a role model, someone who's plugged into the process. Otherwise, it's kind of difficult to really find your way on your own. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, but I still believe that like we live on a, in a digital world and society where we have access to any information that we need to have access to at our fingertips. It really is a digital information highway. Um, so Google, you know, I always say Google is king only because it's the most popular search engine, but there are others, right? And so like, you can literally say, you know, Google search, who are my, you know, what's my local X, Y, and Z, I live here, right? Um, and several resources will pop up, whether it's the local, you know, politicians website, whether it's an aggregated website that allows you to look up all the different um, people that are running for office in your area, you know, what their, what their platforms are, even their phone numbers, right? Like local politicians, these campaigns, you can literally call them up and, and talk to the source, which I, I've always thought that that was kind of cool, right? Like you can email and, and call um, their offices. You not, might not get the candidate, but you'll definitely get their office manager or, or whomever. It's their, like, the information is readily accessible if you if you are looking for it and if you are you know and if you just take a second to to do you know a google search or yahoo search or whatever other you know engine is your preference so the information is always there I also know um, different organizations have been putting out voter guides. And so especially not just for the people, but for the different measures, a lot of times they're worded in very confusing ways. And so there's a lot of double negatives and things going on. Um, and I found that if you tend to lean to one side or another politically, you can often Google um, what the recommendations are for your local elections, um, or even if there's like a neighborhood organization or some other community organizing um, group that you can go to, they often have put something together in order to help their constituents vote in an informed way. So it's good that we're talking about um, community oriented involvement with regards to getting to the polls and um, instilling into one another the importance of voting, especially in local elections. Um, so say, you know, I'm a young person and I'm not old enough to vote. How can I get involved in civic engagement and where would I start? There's a number of avenues. Uh, through, the, through your election administrator's office, uh, some of our, uh, our students are working as poll workers. Uh, 16 years of age and up can, can serve a couple hours at a polling place and some of them can actually get credit for school credit for working or they can uh, elect to receive payment for working a couple of hours. Um, I, I see a lot of uh, kids that are uh, proposing to or seeking internships at with some of their local uh, politicians, some of their local elected officials. Uh, th that'd be my first thought is to is to try your local base and then and then maybe work up to the state level and maybe even apply to be a, an intern at a at a state level at a federal level, but start local and then go from there. 
I also think um, we put so much emphasis on voting, but voting is really the bare minimum of things that you can do to be civically engaged. And so while we all should be voting, there are many other things. And so if you are too young to vote, um, the there really are endless options. Like you could get involved with your community, like neighborhood council, and really just think about the thing, the decisions that are being made right there locally for you. Um, I went to a march over the summer and it was led by a high school student and she was just advocating for her experience of experiencing discrimination um, at her high school and how she um, she believed in the Black Lives Matter movement and wanted to keep that going as well. And so there are so many different ways that you can be civically engaged and um, involved with your community that go beyond voting. And so just seek out something that you're passionate about and see what organizations are out there and just send them an email um, and check in and see see how that goes. I think to even looking at um, the Green New Deal and the Sunrise Movement, a majority of the people involved with Sunrise are high school and college students who really have just taken it upon themselves to move this forward because they see their future being influenced and impacted and they want to shape it in the way they want it to be. It is nice to see um, the younger generation getting really involved in politics and just having political knowledge in general. Um, I don't know if it was that prominent back then, because um, we know mostly it's uh, adults that lead the charge when it comes to political knowledge and decision making and things of that nature. But it is, it's great to see that the youth are starting young and carrying that moving forward. And I hope that when they're adults, they instill that same knowledge into their children. But um, former President Obama said that we should vote and vote some more until we see policy changes. That's great, but to enact change, sometimes we have to be involved. What advice would you give to a young person who would like to run for office? Yeah, I think some of what Anna just said was really poignant in that like, you know, now is a time that you can use your voice and start to um, be involved by, you know, organizing your community or, you know, starting, I, I really do believe that there's like so much momentum in groups and just finding, finding your space and getting involved that way. Um, but then I also think that there are tangible pipeline programs that are starting to grow. There are a ton on the conservative side, um, but there are also some like progressive um, ones that are emerging. Um, as a woman, I'm really big on women from all walks of life on all sides of the aisle, um, starting to be more um, civically engaged. And so pipeline programs like She Should Run um, is one that comes to mind. Emerge is another really dope one. Um, Vote Run Lead is another one as well. Um, and so there are there are ways to get start to get involved in pipeline programs specifically like if you know now that you want to run someday right there is a science to it um and obviously now we're seeing that there's a, a, a way to like avoid that science too and you can and, and and you know there's definitely ways to to get uh into into office without doing it traditionally but i still believe pipeline programs are some of the best ways um to get that to get that done um and i see it a lot on the conservative side so when you think about um like the the justice system or or how many there's more conservative judges than there are um you know like liberal judges a lot of that is because they're in pipeline programs right um that that really do mold them um into having the correct pedigree to be able to do that um and so there are some emerging on the other side of the aisle too and so i, I do think that um, that's a really good way to get involved as well. Uh, Cliff, earlier you brought up um, just uh, schools and I guess the role that they don't play with regards to educating students on voting and the importance of it and participating in uh, uh, local elections and things of that nature. Do you think schools should just teach uh, voting efficacy and um, you know yeah. yeah do you think that school should teach that well I, the, the school curriculum has changed tremendously from when I was growing up and from what I see my friends kids experiencing now and, and there is a, a, a lack of of that that structure that used to be taught about government and about civic responsibility and civic accountability. Kids nowadays, I think, are introduced to more 
social activities, organizations, fundraising activities, uh, and, and those sort of networking or exposing exposing type of activity. So uh, th there's good news there, but yes, I think I think local schools should turn back to to greater civics training which, and, and teaching our kids how to be responsible citizens. So parents, of course, teach their kids how to be responsible individuals, but there's also a way to learn how to be a responsible neighbor and 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 it has to be taught more outside of the home than from inside the home, and and, and so I think the school plays a factor and and has a role to play in in helping establish that neighbor that community that that village that government that environment. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank all of our panelists today for the discussion. Anna, Cliff, and Sophia, so all of you did a excellent job and put out a lot of really valuable informative information. So now, um, do you guys have any last remarks? Get out and vote. <laughs> We're a week away. Something that's super important. Make sure that you're voting up and down the ballot, not just thinking about, like Anna said, the, you know, the president, but think about, you know, those, those local figures as well that are also uh, going to be up and, and get educated and be knowledgeable, but voting is the top line thing here for me. Get out there, let your voice be heard, let nothing stop you uh, because there's so much on the line, no matter where you fall on that line. So, and yeah, no matter what the outcome of the election, like be inspired either way, be inspired that we got out the vote and got change or be inspired that there are so many other ways that you can enact change in your community and try and find those because the battle is not just every four years, it is constantly. And so if we want to achieve health equity and make sure that we're all able to live our best lives, we need to be doing that work um, every day. Yeah, I, I would agree with with both of your, your comments there. and. And I would would say that that folks should be more deliberate about their activities and 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 make deliberate choices and not just flow with the wind and 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 take responsibility, take accountability for your actions, for your activities, and and help help beyond yourself, help help those around you. And I think that'll get us moving in the right direction and on, on many different levels and fronts. Uh, Cliff, I just really want to comment and just acknowledge that last statement about self-accountability is really important, and I like that you're really pushing that forward. And I think most communities really do want to take accountability for their actions, and they just want to be left alone, honestly. But with that, I want to toss it back to Ashante, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. That was a great conversation. I enjoyed it. I was sitting back, thank goodness I was muted because it was, yes, Sophia, yes, Anna, yes, Cliff, snaps and all. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and thank you to our audience for joining us and stay tuned for our next Rodham Impact Speakers installation. Thank you, Breck, you did an awesome job and panelists once again, thank you. Get out and vote. And also you guys, get your flu shot, get your flu shot. COVID doesn't care if you have the flu. It doesn't care. So vote and get your flu shot. Thank you and see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>